Welcome to Forming the Spirit Within, a teaching ministry of Pastor Brad Riley. Pastor Brad is an associate and teaching pastor at First Church of the Nazarene here in Wichita, Kansas. He is the founder and director of the Merciful Servants of Christ, as well as the author of numerous articles. And now, here's Pastor Brad. Well, good morning, everyone. It, welcome. I guess by the looks of the room, we should say Happy Easter, right? It's, it's not Easter yet, but we're almost there. Yeah, I do know that. You say, uh, Christos Anesti. Christos Anesti. That means he is risen. Christ is risen, which is the Easter greeting or Paschal greeting. Christos is C-H-R-I-S-T-O-S. Uh-huh. Yeah. Christos, C-H-R-I-S-T-O-S, Anesti. Christos Anesti. Which word is risen? This is Christ in Greek, and this means risen. Christ is risen. So then you would, if somebody says this to you, you would answer, Alitos. 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 Anesti. That's right. Truly he is risen. Or he's risen. Truly he is risen. Truly he's risen. Yeah. Alitos Anesti. So now you know, now you know there's some Greek this morning. So, uh, <laughs> Greek. It can be, it's easier, yeah, sometimes than Spanish, yeah. So it's a, it's a fun language, Greek is. Greek is a fun language. Uh, Russian. Now that's a hard language. I've tried to learn some Russian. That's that's difficult to pronounce, I think, but fun. Well, if you have your Bible study prayer cards, let's pray together before we begin on this uh, this Holy Thursday of Holy Week today. Illumine our hearts, O Master, Lover of all humanity, with the pure light of your divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our hearts that we may understand your gospel teachings. Implant deep within us the fear of your blessed commandments, that through them we may conquer all carnal desires and may be transformed to live both thinking and doing the things that are pleasing to you. For you, O Lord, are the light of our souls and bodies, and unto you we give all glory and praise together with our Father, who is from everlasting and the all-holy, good, and life-creating Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning on this Holy Week. We are down to the final High Holy Three Days of of this uh, Passion Week of Christ's life on earth. And uh, this is known as Holy Thursday. Some people call it Monday Thursday in the Old English words. It's a night where services around the world, church services around the world, commemorate both the institution of the, the Holy Communion, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, on that last night of, he was with his disciples, which is where we've been in the gospel. That We've been in John chapter 15, all these things we're studying happening that very night at that very meal. And also the foot washing, uh, which was in this very setting that we've been studying as well. So we are, and we're going to continue on. I didn't time it this way. I mean, we're not actually, I mean, tomorrow's Good Friday. We're not actually studying the crucifixion tomorrow because we're not quite there yet. We're just still in finishing John chapter 15, I think, today. But uh, but it's, we're pretty close. It's neat how it's worked out. We started this study in the Gospel of John, August of 2017. I was looking back. I did some hard work on the on the uh, podcast, and everything's up to date. Finally, I was getting woefully behind. So not only do I have everything up to date from this podcast, I mean the Gospel of John, everything's not up to date. But then also the podcast has the five prayer classes I've done on Wednesday night. They're all there now, as of last night. So if you want to listen into some of those prayer classes, if you weren't able to come on Wednesday night, those are fun too. Um, But, you know, here we are, almost two years later, and we're just in chapter 15, and we're looking at the very last night of Christ's life, and we're going just a little bit deeper here in the last part of this chapter. uh, Jesus' words turn to the, the disciples, and he talks to them about the hatred of the world. There are three sections. We're going to try and finish verses 18 through 27, but I want to break it into three sections. The three sections are the first few verses Jesus talks about the hatred of the world towards him and, by extension, them. In the middle couple of verses, Jesus talks about the hatred of the world towards God. 
And then in the last, he seems to bring the remedy for it all, which is the sending of the Holy Spirit. And he speaks about the comforter who is to come. So with that kind of little brief outline, let's jump in and look at the scripture here. I'm going to begin reading in verse 18. Okay? And I'll read on to the end of the chapter. Make sure I have my pages ready here because it splits up. Okay, let's look at the word of the Lord. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all this they will do to you on my account, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates my father, you know, he who hates me, hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have sinned. Now they have seen and hated both me and my father. It is to fulfill the word that it is written in their law, quote, they hated me without a cause, end quote. But when the counselor comes, whom I shall send to you from the father, even the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will bear witness to me. And you also are witnesses because you have been with me from the beginning. We'll end there. That'll Next week we'll take us into chapter 16. Assuming we get all this talked about today. Wow, that's a lot. It seems like more verses than I usually go through in one setting, but I, I, I want to bring them all together because I think they flow together. Um, Jesus begins by speaking about the hatred of the world. I want us to think about some of these these Greek words uh, that we like to do from time to time. Not that I guess it's really important that you remember Greek or, you know, we don't speak it in a conversing language or anything like that. But, but there's such meaning and depth to them that sometimes it reveals something that we wouldn't see otherwise in just our English words. So the first one that I want to give to you is this idea of cosmos. Does anybody know what cosmos means? You've heard it, haven't you? It's not just, it's not just the... A character on the show Seinfeld. Okay. <laughs> no, no, that's Kramer. I'm sorry, Kramer. Isn't his name Ke- Cosmos Kramer? Oh, yeah, oh. he goes by Kramer. Cosmo Kramer. Okay, it's close. I thought I was losing it there for a minute when I remembered it was Kramer. Cosmo Kramer or something like that. What does Cosmos mean? What? The, it could mean the universe. It could mean, and this, there's about three things that it could actually mean. And sometimes in Scripture, it's it's used all three ways. So I want to think about the three different ways that it is used and how it's specifically used here. Sometimes it is used to represent... I'll uh, I'll erase this now so I can write a little more. Sometimes it's used to mean, like we said, the the universe or let's say slash uh, creation. Okay? And particularly, uh, you know, the wonder or the beauty of God's creation, the cosmos. Okay, that's one way Scripture often uses uh, uses it uh, there. Uh, For instance, in this very gospel, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world, right? For God so loved all that He had created. Because it's beautiful. Remember back in the Genesis story? And God created it and said that it was good. So that's one. That's the first way. Then another way is, is that it could be used to mean uh, specifically uh, something that is finite. I may run out of room for these here because I didn't plan well. Something that's finite when compared to the infinite. Does that make sense to you? So this world meaning that 
that was created is is a very inf as a very finite thing as compared to the outside the universe, the world of God, if you will. Okay, that is infinite. God's essence and His being and His we can't really speak of a place because then we're locked into our time and space again. But the infinite of eternity with God versus the finite of just this created world. Sometimes we see that in John chapter 11. Um, John 11, let me, that's not too far back, so I'll just read it for you real quick here. Just a couple pages to turn. John 11, um, verse 9. It says this, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. Okay, so the Jesus was talking in very finite about the light of this world. There's a very finite light in this world, right? The sun. The sun and the moon are the lights of this world, the stars of heaven that reflect it. But that's created, that's finite, Versus, we know Christ, John, one of John's favorite words for Jesus Christ is the light of the world, meaning the uncreated light, the infinite light. God is the source of all light before there ever was such a thing as a created light. So there's the creation, uh, wonder of the universe way to use cosmos. There's the meaning of just the world in a finite sense, planet Earth, that sort of thing, uh, the moon, the sun, the stars. And then the third one is the way this one is meant uh, in this very scripture. How do you hear it when Jesus says, if the world hates you? How do you hear that? It's a third sense from this. What, what do you hear? People. People, that's right. The people of the world. They're the ones that hate. Okay, And he's going, he says, hey, if the people of this world hates you, guess what? Just know that it hated me before it hated you. So we're dealing this morning with this idea of hatred. It's an ugly word, isn't it? Um, I, I remember from, the, from my littlest childhood, one of my earliest memories was my mother always teaching me, you don't hate anyone. Okay? Did you ever hear that from your parents, I hope? You know, you know how we are. We're, we're, we use hyperbole every day, don't we? We, we just do it all the time. We overspeak and things. Oh, I hate that. You know, I mean, there are a few things in this world that I absolutely hate. And they usually are found in the vegetable category. <laughs> <laughs> if you say loathe, that is something. I, yeah, I think that's maybe a good is it synonym. A better way? It's a synonym for this idea of hating something, you know. So that would be a better way. I don't know if it's better or not. I think it kind of has the same meaning, probably. Yeah. You know, and that's where that you raise a good point. It's not so much about the semantics. It's about what we really, it's not the word we choose, but what we mean by it. You know, and that's what I think my mother was trying to tell me. No, you did, now she didn't say it in regards to vegetables. She didn't tell me, no, you don't hate anything. I mean, she would say it when I would say I hate a person, you know, oh, I hate them. You know, as a little boy, she said, no, no, you don't hate anyone. Brussels, don't I said it when I cook Brussels sprouts. No, I, I just leave the room. I leave the house because they stink so bad. I just there are two things in this world that really smell up your house when you cook in a bad way: liver and Brussels sprouts. I don't understand that. I actually like sauerkraut. Isn't that weird? That's a pungent aroma, and I actually like it. So we're all fickle, aren't we? What's one person's aroma of beauty might be another person's. Well, you're right on the liver. <laughs> when my mother would fix liver, we didn't even go in the house. It was like, fine, we'll eat dinner outside. I'm grateful. My mother didn't fix liver. Good job, Faye. Well, so I want you to see. I, I want you to see this idea that this is what God is. Ta this is what Jesus is talking about. The people of this world, they hated Jesus. We want to talk about why they hated him this morning. Because the truth is, Jesus goes on to say here. He says, if you weren't of this world. If you were of this world, the world would love its own. Sometimes I wonder just how well I'm doing in my Christian walk when everyone seems to like me. 
You know, somewhere else in the gospel it says, Jesus says, woe be unto you when all men think well of you. I, I memorized that from the King James, but I forgot to memorize the, the actual chapter and verse <laughs> in the book. It's in one of the four gospels. Jesus says, woe be unto you when all men think well of you. I just throw that out there when, you know, it, we're not here in this world to please people, but we are here in this world, as we talked about last week, to love people, love everyone. And remember the last last week's lesson, we talked about actually loving with God's love, loving as Jesus, as he said, as I have loved you, now go love one another, meaning with that unconditional love. How do you love people that hate you? Can you love them but just like what they do without it interfering with you loving them? Well, I think that's probably valid. Um, you know, I, I think this is where we come to the interior. Jesus is drawing his disciples to the interior of their heart. You can, you is loving people different than liking people? I think it is. I definitely think it is. Don't you think that? Um, let me see how this. That you um, can maybe. Just tell me, I don't know. Hate the situation, like I hate how it is with mm-hmm. my dad and I. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. like it. You hate the situation, but, but you don't hate him. I want the best for him. He's sure. God's child. Sure. And um, even though I haven't been treated well and that sort of thing, um, God has helped me that, you know, um, I I want the best for him. I want him to be happy. I want him to make it to heaven. You know, but I just can't be on the emotional roller coaster. Well, and I think it's like we say God hates our sin, Mm -hmm. but he he loves the sinner. Okay. It's kind of that concept. So a situation, um, uh, perhaps, the same with a person. We, We must find a way to not hate people, even our enemies. We must find a way. Because that's the way of Christ. The way of Christ is to not only love our enemies, but to lay down our life for them. And that we talked, we just barely got into that last week. I, I mean, that's a huge concept that's going to take a lot of prayer and meditation. Because I, how do we lay down our lives for those who actually hate us? Can you love the person, but you're still frustrated? And since you can't say hate or loathe, you just give it to God? That you can mm-hmm. be in a position where you're kind of done with the emotional roller coaster? Well, yeah, I think that's that's a, that's getting into a relational aspect. That's kind of what Rhonda was describing. You know, we can, because we're called to love everyone, we're not called to be uh, abused by everyone, okay? There might be a situation where a person is abusive. Well, you, God does not give you the freedom to hate them, but he doesn't call you to stay in an abusive situation either. So there, you, there's there's some relational aspects that we want to consider. Yeah. Can you love someone without liking them? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's kind of what we're talking about. Yeah. That's what we're... Yeah. I, I think that's kind of what we're talking about. But as soon as we say that, well, I can love, I can lo- I can not like them, but I'll still uh, love them in in Christ. As soon as we say that, what we don't want to do, we don't want to use that as a crutch. God wants you to be happy, not miserable. Sure he does. And he wants you to walk away from the misery. That's what I mean by not staying in an abusive situation. He definitely does not call us to stay in abusive situations. But And sometimes we think about marriages and we think about uh, people that are maybe abused physically and verbally and emotionally. And there's many ways of abuse. Um, what God does not allow us to do is leave those situations with hatred in our heart for the abuser. Now... In our humanity, that's probably where we begin, okay, because we're human. But the, the message of the gospel and the redemptive message of Christ is that eventually that, maybe through lots of therapy, maybe through lots of prayer, that hatred gives way. Because if we keep hatred in our hearts, that kind of bitterness, it will consume us. That's right. It will consume us. So we are called to love everyone, even though some may be seemingly <laughs> very unlikable. Uh, the Apostle Paul, I think, again, I, it's the book of Romans, I think, but I, again, I don't have this chapter and verse. 
because I used to use this as a crutch too, <laughs> scripture crutch. I used to say the Apostle Paul said, uh, in as much as possible, be at peace with all men. And so what I began to do was parse that apart and say, oh, okay, in as much as possible. So therefore, it must be possible to not be at peace with all men. So I'm okay not to be at peace with that person because that person drives me crazy. You know, that's a, that was a crutch I used to use. But God began to get a hold of me and say, Brad, you're using my words as a crutch. You're called to love. Love everyone, not use my word as a crutch. Yes? Uh, my, still my witness that comes to me so much is the Amish when the guy went in and shot the children in the schoolhouse. Mm. And then they went to his widow mm. and ministered unto her. Wow. They may not have felt the love, but by doing the actions, I think mm. it would follow. Yeah. Or they may not have, maybe they did love him. That's why they could go do it. They didn't like him, but they certainly loved him. And and I think I think that action is really important. Yeah. How can they do that? Right. The world took notice of it, didn't they? And and I think that's what that's why like we made a comment last week. The world was changed. It was one for Christ. The empire, the Roman Empire, was one for Christ. And it was not run, not won by great preaching. And it was not won by powerful musical services. It was won by love. Love that, as we're going to read, as we go through this, we'll go a little further. There's another word that we're going to use here. I have it written down. And it is the word martyria. Martyria. We're going to talk about that one in a little bit, too when we get towards the end of these verses. But for now, let's see that Jesus is saying something important about this idea of the world hating us. I mean, it's no fun to know that we're part of a we're part of a faith, a religion that the world hates. Okay? And we wonder, you know, we've been protected by that in America. We've been in this supposed country that was founded on Judeo-Christian principles and and you know the Ten Commandments were in every courthouse and prayer was in every school. And I mean, we were protected by this hatred of the world because we had a, a, a supposed government that was to be at least, if not Christian, at least tolerant of Christian and based loosely on it. OK, that's where we've been. That's our history for the last few hundred years. Well, you know that you, you know as well as I do, that's quickly falling apart. That's, I can't believe where we've fallen in my lifetime. And I'm, I'm not trying to get political with you. I'm not going to take a side on whether we should or shouldn't do such and such. But I, I'm just saying I can't believe how far the, the, the country has fallen in terms of its hatred for Christianity. Now you just turn on the nightly news. It hates Christianity. I mean, more and more we as Christians are learning what it means to be the minority and to be a persecuted minority. Nothing in comparison to our brothers and sisters like in the Middle East are having their heads cut off. That hasn't come to our shores yet, but you never know. Was yes. It when we were in Jerusalem or Bethlehem, I'm trying to remember, and they said there's very few Christians That's right. Left. Christians are being stamped in Bethlehem, the city of Jesus' birth. Johnny, our guide, when we were there, he's a member of the Church of the Nativity. He's a Greek Orthodox Christian, member of the Church of the Nativity. He, he was telling us, he says, there are, he fears that in 10 years there would not be any Christians left in Bethlehem. They are, they are pushing them out, pushing them out, persecuting them in such, at such a level. The Palestinians are, because Bethlehem is controlled. Israel has allowed Bethlehem to be controlled as Palestinian territory, and Palestinians are pushing the Christians out. Uh, sad. But it's, he's seen it go down dramatically in his lifetime, and he's, you know, roughly my age. Uh, it's happening. It's happening all over the world. Now, this was written 2,000 years ago. We can look at times throughout history where there was peace and prosperity and Christianity seemed to flourish uh, in different ways, in different places. We know that the call of the Christian disciple is to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth, the great commandment. You know, go ye therefore into all the world, teaching them to be my disciples. So our job's not done just because we're being persecuted. And our job's not done just because the world hates us. 
In fact, if anything, we're just getting ramped up in our generation. We're just getting going on the path we should be going because of this hatred of the world and what it's Sometimes what it's going to do I to us. I wonder if the Christians that are still um, not scared to verbally admit that they love Christ is kind of an example of the generations down the line to have faith and courage and not be scared. Because I think a lot of times, like in those places, that there's so much, there's if they do believe, they're scared to come out and mm-hmm. like openly admit it because of what might happen. Yeah, absolutely. There's probably a great deal of fear in those places. Um, there is in our own lives, if we're honest. I mean, how many of us could say, "We're there. Bring on the, bring on the, the terrors. Bring on the, you know, the." We talked last week about the. 21 Coptic believers who had their heads cut off, you know, we we don't want that. We don't want that for us. Nobody would want that. But if it comes, are we ready for it? Well, I'm good with my maker. I'm I'm good with my maker, but I got to be honest with you. I've got some trepidation in my soul. Okay. I'm not ready for somebody to put a knife to my neck and say, I'm going to cut your head off. I mean, I, I know I'm getting a little graphic and gruesome, but I'm just trying to shake us out of our. Out of our what, our low of a kind of a numbness that I feel that we have in this country. Yes. More important, are you ready for him to have a knife to your wife's neck? No, no. not at all. Okay. No, it's a, to, thanks for making it much more difficult, Sylvia. <laughs> <Shelby. laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. You're right, though. Can You're right. It's a conflict into life because one of the commandments are, "Thou shalt not kill." Mm-hmm. But on the other hand. Somebody puts a knife up to her neck. You're going to protect her, and if it happens, to yeah. I mean, you got to make a choice. These are really tough choices in the world, aren't they? And I don't hate them on the door. I really <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to again. I'm not. I'm not without sin in that sense. I'm going to have to. God's love is going to have to really come into purifying. I really don't think God's going to condemn you for saving somebody that believes in Him mm-hmm. and is His child. Because, okay, one thing that has always been a conflict as I'm growing up, onward Christian soldiers, that one that the old him. off to war. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, why are we going to war killing when thou shalt not kill and we're children right. of God? Well, you know, there are two schools of thought on that, and there are huge. There's some people that would say we should never sing that hymn in church. Of course, nobody sings hymns anymore, so I guess that's a moot point. But, uh, <laughs> but, but onward, Christian soldiers marching as to war. Okay, it does. It's not a call to war. It's a. It's as if there, and we are in a war. We're in a war against Satan. Would be an as if. Yeah. Now, yeah, I, you know. If somebody were going to try and kill my family, I'm, I'm going to protect them. Bottom line, I'm going to protect them. I don't know how. Okay? I don't know how. I don't, as a minister of the gospel, I don't even own a gun. I don't even want a gun. I don't want a gun. You know, I don't care how bad things get. I don't want a gun. But I'm going to protect them the best I can. Okay? Knowing that God is ultimately our protector. Because God always tells us to fight for the widows and the orphans and the, the, the elderly and the abused and the poor. and the, You know what I'm saying? So I, there, I'm not, not trying to teach you this little, oh, well, you know, whatever. The world hates us. They come kill us. It's okay. We, you know, go be at peace, sister. I'm sorry they're going to kill you, but that's okay. No, we want to we stand up for what we believe. But yet at the same time, we want to leave room for God to be God. We are not God. We are not the judge. We are not the punisher. Only God has the uh, the power to punish and the right to punish. Now, let's move on a little bit here because I, I think there's something we're missing. Jesus said in verse 19, I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. It's very important that you note that the choice to be a Christian is the choice that Jesus made for you. He called you. He called me, and he called us to be out of the world, not part of it. Now, we're going to talk more about that when we get to his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. Okay, in there, Jesus speaks very poignantly that I've 
you know, Father, I pray that you will uh, keep them uh, while they're in the world. They're not supposed to be of the world. So there, there is this fine line between being part of the world. Okay, that's the people one here. There's a fine line between part of this people group in the world and not being really of it. Because the church, the very word church, means a gathered, called out community. Distinct, separate from everything else. So when we're in Christ, when we're in church, in the church, we are not to be part of the world. So there should be distinctives. The church should not look necessarily like the world looks. The church should not talk like the world talks. The church should not act like the world acts. And I fear that one of the reasons we are having such troubles in our society, in this modern society that we live in, is that there is very little distinction in many churches and the world. I think it means the world system, because God calls us to love the world. Calls us to love creation. See, we have to be careful which one we're talking about. He calls us to love creation, but he does not call us to love the system of the world. The world system. Yeah, the world system we're not called to love. You're right. It seems to me that John is very black and white as we've been studying him. Uh Uh-huh. And what we're talking about here, there's so much gray that we don't know the black and the white anymore Mm -hmm. in our society. Yeah. It seems like we need our limitations, our boundaries need to be more precise. And they're blurry. And I think you're right, because when they heard this from John, when they heard this from Jesus, and as John began to write his gospel and it began to proliferate in the world and be taught, it wasn't that hard to understand. They knew they were being called to love the world, to lay down their lives to the world, to, to, to be Christ to the world. And now there's this blur because, well, let's just say it, too many Churches, too many pastors, too many preachers and teachers do not preach the full gospel. The full gospel. And and the full gospel includes calling sin, sin, and calling people to redemption out of that way of life. Not just adopting that way of life and saying, well, God covers it all. Yes, ma'am. When this church was burning, Oh, in the Notre Dame Cathedral? Yeah. He was just charging right in. Yeah. How old was that church? I think it was uh, nearly a thousand years, give or take a few. Somewhere around, built around the year, built around the year, the the, the millennium, the turn of that first millennium. Um, So roughly a thousand years. Uh, they said the third richest man in America is going to put millions of dollars back into restoring it. I think there's already been lots of gifts of money given to restore it. Um, and you'll hear people on both sides of that. You know, we, To me, uh, to me, it's a tragedy that it burned. I, I love history, and I, love, I think it's an icon of our faith. Yeah, it's a Roman Catholic church. I'm not Roman Catholic. It's still, it's from an era and time when we're all Catholics. We just don't understand that word. You know, we're all universal Christians. We're all, there is one body of Christ, one church. One, as, as the Apostle Paul says, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. Yeah, he says that in the book of Ephesians. So that church is my church too, okay? And it, and it hurts to see it burned like that. And we don't know the reasons why. But still, whatever the reasons why, it's tragic. And, and I hope they can rebuild it. Certainly hope, hope they will. I hope, I'm, I'm sure they will. Um, but again, it's a, it, it, it is, if it was nefarious, if it was by vandals or any reason like that, if it was by terrorism or vandals or anything, we don't know that it is. I'm not trying to speculate. But I'm saying if it were, wow, that's just another sign of the world hating Christ, you see. What's a great icon that we can burn up of Christ so that the world gets the message we don't know? I'm not saying that's why it was, okay? I'm not trying to get political on you. I'm just saying we don't know. So why speculate on what we don't know? But what we do know is that there have been many throughout 2,000 years, many times and places where churches, Christians, 
things that have been destroyed in the name of hatred of Christ. Well, where was it? Alabama or Mississippi where they had those three churches with those black people? Mm -hmm. um, well, there's just so many. Who could count? You know, yeah. One of the most recent ones was Charleston, South Carolina. You yeah. know, that was a horrible That's one. That's what I'm thinking. But, but what we're seeing here is, and this will, kind of, this will be a good segue as we move. Jesus said in verse 20, remember... I told you in verse, he's saying in chapter 13, we know it's in chapter 13, verse 36. He's saying, remember I told you a servant is not greater than his master? Hey, this world crucified Jesus. What makes you think it won't crucify you is what he's saying. Why do we deserve better than Jesus? We're not greater than our master. I mean, to call, the, call to, the call to follow Christ is a call to die. It's a call to die to yourself. It's a call to perhaps die. It's a call to die in this world. For sure, we just perhaps in a bad way. But it's a call to be persecuted. It's a call to all kinds of things, none of which necessarily are good, save the fact that it is a call to glory. And it is a call to eternal goodness and eternal life and eternal happiness. And that outweighs it all. To be reborn again. To live in eternity is outweighing any price we pay here in this world. We have to remember that. So when Jesus says that, he's reminding us, you know, if they did it to me, they'll do it to you. Now, he says something important in verse 21. All this they will do on my account because they do not know who sent me. Mm -hmm. First, let's think about who's the they. Now, I know he's been talking about the world. Particularly, I think he, we can say that the they is the leadership of the Jews. What John in his gospel often uses that phrase, the Jews. He doesn't mean it anti-Semitically. We've talked about that before. He's talking about the leaders, the Pharisees, the rulers of the Jews, the Sadducees and those. They hated Jesus. Why did they hate Jesus? Well, Jesus gives us the answer right here. He's, they didn't really know God. Now, that phrase is kind of almost mind-bending because these are the very people of God, right? Out of all the whole world, God chose Abraham and then he chose Moses, and then he chose, you know, to build this people of God, you know, and they're called the first Hebrews and later Jews, and here's this protected people of God, this covenant people of God, and they don't know God. That's a kind of a weird thought, isn't it? Well, how, could they how could they not know God? Well. How can we expect the ones that hate Jesus that don't know God see, to I, know God if the ones that followed him didn't even know him? Well, let's, let's think about the ones who, who were here following the, the Pharisees, those who are actually attacking Jesus, those who are plotting his death. What does it mean when it says they didn't know God? They knew God's law, right? Nobody knew, nobody knew God's law better than them. They didn't have a relationship. But they didn't have a relationship. They didn't know God's they didn't law. They thought they had a relationship. They didn't okay? have it in their hearts. There you go. They thought they had a relationship with God, and they found that relationship through the keeping of the law. Amen. Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commandments. So that's not all wrong. But what we find is what's missing, what the missing piece is the heart. It's always about the heart. Just get that down in your mind when you think about your Christian faith. It's always about the heart. Even, even sin. Are we culpable for our sins? We are if... They're from the heart because, you know, we define sin in the New Testament terms as a willful transgression. We, we willfully transgress against God, even though in some grand scale where everything that's not perfect by God's standard is, is sin. But yet there's this thing called willful sin. And we're going to see that because Jesus is going to talk about that in this very next section. This, this from 22 to 25, he's basically saying, you know, if I hadn't come... If I hadn't come to preach to them and I hadn't come to do these miracles for them, well, they wouldn't have known their sin. There wouldn't have been a culpability, you see. They would have been ignorant of the truth. But he says, hey, I did things that nobody else has ever done. Nobody else could do. I preached and gave them the words of truth. Now, obviously, I'm paraphrasing these verses. But he's saying, now, in verse 24, now they have seen and hated both me and my father. So Jesus is teaching us something very important. You cannot hate Jesus unless you hate God. 
because Jesus is God. And Jesus says over and over in John's gospel said, I and the Father are one. So it's not just a hatred of Jesus, it's a hatred of God the Father. And they would not, if the Pharisees were standing here today and we were having this discussion with them, they would say, are you crazy? We don't hate God. We love God. That's why we keep his law in such as perfectly as we can. I mean, that's, but here's the problem. They elevated the law to the place of God rather than the person we were to have the relationship with. You see? Now, this gets a little sticky, but let's go back. I want to go all the way to the book of Deuteronomy. I'm trying to fit all of this into they one lesson. They were related to that one Pharisee that wanted to bring God back into... Um, I'm stuck on it, I want to say. There was like a Pharisee or some um, king that brought Christ back in, and after he died, they didn't worship him no more. I'd have to go back. I'm not quite sure which one you're thinking of, but it wasn't like King Tut. It was like in, like back in there. Huh. Well, if you like, think of it, let me know because I'm not sure what you're thinking of. There was like kings and Pharisees, mm-hmm. and they didn't worship God. And then there was this one mm. that became king, and he brought it back into um, oh. lot, their daily things. And there was a lot of people that were against it, and. I think they end up killing him or something. I'm not sure. I'd have to yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure of what you're thinking of there. If you have a Bible with you, go ahead and turn it back to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30. Because there's something we dare not miss here. Deuteronomy chapter 30. What I'm going to tell you this morning is that it's always been about the heart. Growing up, I always thought, well, you know, the Old Testament was about the law. and the New Testament, it's about the heart. You know, Jesus has fulfilled the law. We don't have to worry about trying to keep that law so perfectly because, you know, Jesus fulfilled it for us. And and there's truth to all of that. But yet, again, let's never use Scripture as a crutch, okay? Let's get to the heart of the matter. And the truth is, it's always about the heart. Now, this is all the way back to the days of Moses. This is the end of the book of Deuteronomy. Moses is giving kind of God's final words to the people, and, and to Joshua, who will be their new leader as they go into the promised land. And here's what he says in, in uh, chapter 30 begins with the thought that, uh, now, it shall, now it shall be when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse. In the previous chapters, Moses had delineated what God had told him that there's going to, he gave him a list of blessings and a list of curses. You can choose this day who you want. If you want to be blessed, then you need to love God and follow his ways. But if you don't do what he says, the curses are going to come upon you. Choose life or death, you know, blessing or curse. That's what he's talking about. Previous chapters. And he says, and you will reflect in your heart among all the nations where the Lord God scatters you. So he's telling them there's coming a day you're going to be scattered. He knows God's already revealed to me. He knows they're going to choose the, they're going to choose the curses. They're not going to obey. When they get into that promised land, we know the history of Israel. They constantly disobey God. They get constantly overtaken and eventually scattered across the known world. And he said, "There's going to come a day you're going to you're going to remember all this in your heart." Now let's go a little further into it. In verse 11, 11 through 14 are very important in this chapter. Let's listen to these words. Deuteronomy 30, verses 11 through 14. For this commandment I command you today is not too burdensome for you, nor is it far off. What commandment? He's talking about the commandment to choose. Choose God's way of blessing or choose the curses, one or the other. You choose life in God or you choose death and curse if you're away from God. That's the commandment, okay? I'm I'm restating it because we don't have time to go back and study the last few chapters of Deuteronomy. So verse 11 again. For this commandment I command you today is not too burdensome for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven above that you should say, Who will descend into heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, Well, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear and do it? Verse 14 is the key. But the word is very near you, in your mouth, in your heart, and in your hands, that you may do it. 
Moses told them then. God told them through Moses. It's all about the heart. You, what is he saying? He's saying you have the power to do this because God loves you and you are his chosen people. And there's absolutely nothing he won't do for you if you love him and make him your God and serve him only. And the truth of that is already in your heart. Clear back in Deuteronomy. It's already in the heart. Okay? And other, uh, there's other places in this book where he t- in Deuteronomy he talks about, he calls them to circumcise their hearts. Circumcise their hearts. You, you know what that means. Cut away all the sin. Set apart God as Lord of your heart. I mean, it's always been about the heart. It's not just an excuse to say, oh, they just had to keep the law. Well, they, the only way to keep the law is with your heart. God knows your heart better than you do. Absolutely, and they missed that. Over centuries and centuries of time, they missed that. They Ultimately, I would have to say they chose to miss it. They chose to harden their hearts, okay? And that's a, let that be a lesson to us today. It's about the heart. You and I, we have the gospel. We have the truth. We have the, we have the time of history and the lessons of history and all the facts. We have so much, but we must choose to trust the word of God, the truth of what we've seen, and know that we must accept it in our heart. It must be become about it must be about our hearts. The only way to truly serve the Lord is from the heart. Um, in, in verses 22 through 25, he talks about their cult back to the Gospel of John now in 15. He talks about their culpability there. And, and then he says in the end, verse 25, it is to fulfill the word that it is written in their law, quote, they hated me without a cause, end quote. Jesus is quoting the book of Psalms. That is from Psalm 69 in your Bibles. Some, if you were reading a Septuagint text, it would be Psalm 68. But it is verse 5 of Psalm 69. They hated me without a cause. There truly is no cause to hate Jesus Christ. All Jesus Christ did was good, and all he did was love, and everything he did was pure. But if you're not if you're not open to the truth, it looks evil, and that's what happened. You see, the the leaders of the Jews had elevated the law of Moses, and that is the salvation of God. They had elevated it to the point that there was nothing else. There's room for nothing else. There wasn't room for a Messiah. They didn't want a Messiah. Truth was, they liked what they had. They liked their power. And when Christ came, challenging all of those egos and all those prides and all that power they said let's crucify this guy they couldn't even see the love in him they couldn't see God in him so they chose to crucify him now that's that situation is still being played out in our world when it says the world hates us who follow Jesus it's just like the Pharisees hated Jesus why? Because we are we, the message of the gospel, the Christian, is a, an affront to the power struggles of this world, the kingdoms of this world, okay? We turn it on its head. We say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. We say, treat others as you would have them treat you. You know, everything, everything in, the, in the gospel is antithetical to the way the world thinks and operates. I thought about that, too, and if they treat you mean, you can't treat them mean back. So, That's right. I mean, there's always fine lines and exceptions and curves. <laughs> <laughs> there is. Look at the last section with me. I think we can get to it here in our last. How much time do we have? Maybe. Eh, started a little late. Let's, let's take about ten minutes here. In those last two verses, Jesus has talked to them about the hatred of the world. Now, I... Did I, I kind of forgot that I had all these words on the board here. <laughs> got too busy, got going here. The, the, this, this word, the second word here, this is, this is the word for hatred. I, we've talked so much about it, and I forgot to bring it back into you from the Greek. This is the word for hatred that is used in the scriptures here. And, and what we find when we look it up in the Greek is we find that it, it means to detest something, but it also means to love something less. 
there's kind of a, a, a multiple meaning there. So, and we, if we think about it, the scripture uses the same word to say if you love something less than you do this, it's the same as hating it. It's detesting it. Okay? So anything we love, if we love God less, I think what I take from that, I want you to take from that, if we love God less than anything, it's hatred. And we, we, we tend to console ourselves, oh, I don't hate God. I really don't. You know, who wants to, we don't want to think we hate God, you know, but yet we don't want to give him everything sometimes. What we don't want to totally follow him. Is that the same thing? Well, there's probably a pathway you can follow, and that's why the gospel calls us to love. Okay? Remember, you don't hear these things and automatically, oh, well, I'll change my heart. I'll be on the loving side. You know, it takes time and effort and discipleship and learning to go through life. We don't, we don't, we're not just, we don't just go to Bible study and become instant, sanctified, purified, perfect Christians, you know. We, it takes time. It's a journey. It's a spiritual journey. But part of why we're here today is to learn this journey. It's really about love. Love for our enemies. Love for those who persecute us. And and to love them less, you know, than Christ calls us to is not good. But the, I wanted you to have that word because it, it has such a powerful meaning. And then, of course, now we're going to look at a section where these last two words come into play. And we've heard this parakletos before. Does anybody remember what that is? John's taught us that before. What's parakletos? The comforter. Right, the, the advocate, but mostly the comforter can be used both ways. But the idea that he wants to get across is that, that, that he's the one who comes to advocate on our behalf and thus bring us the comfort of God. Now, let's hear what he says. In, in 26 through 27, Jesus says, but when the counselor comes, that's where the parakletos comes in. The counselor or the comforter or the advocate, the one who intercedes on our behalf to God for us to, to kind of work on our behalf. He says, Whom I shall send to you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness to me. Now, the word there for witness, if we were reading it, is this last word. So this one, in this case, it's counselor, but it could equally say comforter. Does anyone's Bible say comforter? Yes, helper. helper, okay. King James. King James says comforter. Okay. Says Yours says counselor, and, and my RSV says counselor. But these both are accurate. Now, martyreo. Martyreo is the word where we read the word witness. So where it says that he will be, he will bear witness to me. Okay. It's mart, mart, The word is martyreo. Okay. What is what does that word mean? We've talked about it before, but you might not remember. Martyr. What? You get that word? To bear witness. To bear witness is to martyr in Greek. Wow. How many of us think of that as a positive word? I mean, what's a martyr? Well, in the technical sense, it's a witness. You know, what is your witness if it's not worth dying for? That's what it's basically saying. What is, what is that? Jesus' witness is true, isn't it? Because he laid down his life for it. And the Holy Spirit is, is, in that sense, bearing witness to us. But look what the very next line says. And you also are witnesses. What did they hear that night? Martyreo. Now, I want to spend just a couple of minutes on this thought because it's important. It's, it's a theological thought, but it has a point to make. We've talked about it before, but I know not everybody's always here, so I don't mind going over these things again because it's part of our theological learning. When Jesus goes to great lengths here to talk about the Holy Spirit, he talks about him very theologically. He says that, number one, the Holy Spirit is coming, and he says, I will send him. Okay, that's right there in verse 26. But I will send him to you from the Father. Okay? Who is the spirit of truth? He goes ahead and gives him that name. Who, and then Jesus, it wasn't enough to just say uh, from the Father. He says, who proceeds from the Father? Two thoughts here that I want to give you. I want want to try and tackle as good as anyone can 
which is not very good for, on my behalf, I'm sure. But this whole thought of God, the Godhead, okay? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What does the Scripture teach us about the Son of God, Jesus, in terms of his relationship to the Father? He is the Father in flesh. He is begotten. There's a big word here that it's used. He's begotten, okay? He's begotten, okay? I didn't even begin to spell that right. <laughs> begotten. Let me turn around here so I can spell it. He is God's. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, begotten son, okay? So this word describes <coughs> Jesus in his relationship to the Father, okay? He's begotten. And what did begotten mean? It meant that he was... He is from all eternity, but somehow he's, 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 if you go back in the old genealogies, and so begat, so, and so begat, so, and so begat. So it's, a, it's a paternal line, it's a, it's a uh, you know, it's a familial thing. Father, son, he's begotten. There was, but scripture teaches there was never a time when he was not. You know, he is, he is, they're both eternal, okay, and they're both one, but still, for under, for helping our feeble minds understand He's begotten. Now, Scripture does not say that the Holy Spirit is begotten. Okay, the Holy Spirit is not begotten of the Father. It does nowhere it says that. In fact, this is the definitive passage in Scripture that teaches on the Holy Spirit theologically. And it teaches us that he proceeds from the Father. And it teaches us, it teaches us that Jesus asks the Father, and he so Jesus can be said to send him. But he does it by asking the Father so that he proceeds from the Father. Now, He's what? the Father in the flesh who died and risen and turned into the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the flesh. He's the incarnate God. But he is not the Father. We, never disti- we always keep them all three separate persons, yet mystically one God. Okay. Oh, I, I know that's in hard. In the very beginning, I am with you and you are with me and we are one. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And we are one. Jesus said that, yes. They're one, but yet they're separate. That's part of the mystery. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you something here in just a second. Give me a minute to develop this. This is the creed. This is the creed we've learned before and talked about so many times. You, you have a card on it and your Bible's tucked away. You know, this is the creed written in the year 325 and again in 381 or something like that, where they, they wrote the Nicene Creed. <coughs> I believe... In the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. Okay? Now, fast forward a couple of centuries. In the Western Church in Spain, they were battling against... uh, they were bad. This is in the sixth century. They're battling against all kinds of barbarians coming in, and they're trying to teach that Jesus is really God. And and the the Western Church made a critical error. The Western Church changed what the creed. The creed was used. It was to, always used to teach. It was the number one teaching tool of this is what Christianity is. Okay, the Nicene Creed. And in that creed, they changed it and they added a little word in there, and it said, and that word is in Latin because they taught it in Latin in Spain in those days. Filioque, filioque, which means and the son, in Latin, and the son. And so they changed it. Where the creed should have said, it originally said, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, and together with Father and Son is worshipped and glorified. They said, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and is worshipped and glorified. Well, I know on some level you all think, well, this is just silly, it's just semantics, but it's really not because it changes the theological understanding of the Godhead. Okay? Now, here's what, here's what I want to read to you. This I found this kind of actually kind of humorous, but very, very deep and theological too, if I can find it. On this very point, boy, all of the early church fathers really hammer this point. Because Western Christianity from that point on, that's what split West from East. By the year 1000, that happened in the 6th century, and by the 11th century, East and West were completely split over this, over many issues, but this was a defining issue. 
Because number one, the Western church did not have the right to change the creed. The creed was the property of the whole church and could only be changed or rewritten if it was the whole church in council doing it together because that's how it was written originally. So what happened is, uh, here's this is, this is a man named St. Gregory of Nazianzus. St. Greg, Gregory of Nazianzus was a bishop, archbishop of Constantinople, kind of one of the reigning uh, in the fourth century, reigning bishops over there. He says this, he says, you tell me what position will you assign to that which proceeds, which has started up between the two terms of your distinctions, which are begotten and unbegotten, okay, and is introduced by a better theologian than you, namely Jesus himself. So Jesus is the one that inter, inter, uh, he enters all this. He's the one that kind of brings this out. So we need to honor what he's thinking here. And it says here, um, in speaking of the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father, because he proceeds from that source, he is not a creature. Okay, he's not created like we are, just like Jesus is not created. Uh, And because he's not begotten, then he's not a son either. If he was begotten, the Holy Spirit would be a son of God, and Jesus wouldn't be his only son. Would transformed be a good word? Hold, Hold that thought. No, because he's, it's just it's proceeding, okay? Just begotten. Transformation is what happens in us. God never changes. God never changes, okay? So now, and because he's not begotten, he's not a son. So if we say that he proceeds from the Father and the Son, it, it messes the whole equation up. Now, listen to this. And because he is between the begotten and the unbegotten, the, Jesus is the begotten, the Father is the unbegotten, Okay? unbegotten because he's between them somehow okay it says that he is god and so escaping the labors of your syllogisms <laughs> about the spirit he has manifested himself as god stronger than any of your distinctions so then he asked the question what then is his procession in other words how is it that he proceeds from the father here's the important part Tell me what the unbegottenness of the Father is, and I'll explain to you the physiology of the generation of the Son and the procession of the Spirit. And we shall both of us be frenzy-stricken for prying into the mystery of God. (laughs) I love that line. (laughs) You know, (laughs) theologians can argue all day long, and at the end of the day, they're going to be frenzy-stricken. They're prying into the mystery of God that we have no reason to pry into. Here's the biggest sin of pride, the biggest sin we can all create is the prideful sin that says, I think I can be God. I think I can know God. I think I can figure all this out. Yeah, that's what Satan did. You see, that's the ultimate sin of pride. We can't understand this. I'm telling you that for 2,000 years, the church of the Christian church, the people who have followed Jesus Christ and taught, have taught that God is three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Son is is begotten of the Father who is unbegotten, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. If we monkey with that, who are we to even do that? This is what Jesus taught us. And then the early church fathers and the creeds after that. And it's fascinating to me that much of Western Christianity is actually waking up to this. And more and more, I have friends in other churches that use the creed in their liturgies quite regularly, more and more are dropping that and the Son. They come, they, they're seeing, oh, you know, I think they were right. We shouldn't have monkeyed with that. Just to try and honor what Jesus says here. So, wow, we've covered a lot of ground, and we usually do in here. Uh, I want to kind of bring it all back into focus. Chapter 15, Jesus introduced us to this metaphor of the vine. He's the vine, we're the branches, God's the vine dresser. And the only place there's really life is in staying connected to the vine. That's Jesus. And now he's teaching us at the end of this chapter that his true disciples will love one another because that's what he's commanded them to do. And they will understand that the world will hate you. The world will hate you for following me. But that's okay. Because in just a few chapters, they're going to learn that he's risen. He's conquered death. We're about to celebrate that in just a few days. All because of 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's the power. How do we love our enemies? We can't. But in the resurrection power of God, we can. We must accept that we cannot live this Christian life on our own. That's, that's rule number one. That's one the Pharisees missed. They thought that they kept the law by their own power, their own meticulous power, and they tried hard. They tried real hard. And Peter says in his epistle, our, neither our fathers nor us could keep the law, <laughs> meaning the law of Moses. But thanks be to God, Jesus Christ has overcome death, and it is his resurrection power at work in us, teaching us, transforming us, to use the word you used earlier, transforming us into people that can love, that can be his disciples. Um, so, lots to talk about. We're going to go deeper in chapter 16. We'll start next time with chapter 16. Uh, Jesus is warning further about the coming persecution and talking more about the Holy Spirit. So do not get too discouraged if everything I just said about the the, the Trinity and the... And the uh, the Holy Spirit, don't, don't get too discouraged because we're going to talk about it in a little, it gets a little plainer as Jesus goes on, okay? He's going to talk even more about it. We've got a lot to follow in verse, chapter 16 and 17. Yes? In the very beginning, what did you say? Eludus anesti Oh, oh, the Greek words, Christos anesti. Christ is risen, alethos anesti. Yeah. Alethos anesti means truly he is risen or he is risen indeed. Well, I kept you 13 minutes late. I apologize. Big stuff to cover there. Let's, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this class and those who have taken time out of their life to come and sit down and open your word and, and trying to discern where your Holy Spirit is leading them. God, I pray that nothing I teach or say would mislead anyone, but, but cover over that if it does or is wrong. As we prepare our hearts for the miracle of the resurrection, would you show us, guide us, direct us in the sacred assembly we are called to this Good Friday? Would you lead us and be the, the very uh, inhabitants of, of our prayers and our fasting that we would truly come out on the other side of this incredible resurrection experience as your disciples, as your church, being led where you want us to go, to be what you want us to be. We ask this in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who lives with you, Father, and the Holy Spirit as one God forever and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. This has been Forming the Spirit Within. I'm Roger Culver, inviting you to tune in next time as Pastor Brad opens God's Word, helping us to form the Holy Spirit within us. Until then, may grace and peace be with you.